Hello, I'm Tom Stevens. Welcome to the TomBot Fireside Chat series. Fireside Chats are interviews with experts from the fields of health, technology, and pets, along with stories shared by the family members of those suffering from health adversities. Today's guest is Brianna Marshall, Doctor of Veterinary Medicine. Welcome, Dr. Michelle. Thanks, Tom. Dr. Michelle is an assistant professor of shelter medicine at the Western University of Health Sciences, works in private practice and nonprofit sector as a relief veterinarian, and is president and founder of Pause for Elders. Pause for Elders' mission is to enrich the lives of senior citizens through the human-animal bond. Their goal is to be an all-in-one resource to create access to animal interactions for seniors. Dr. Michelle received her Doctor of Veterinary Medicine from Western University of Health Sciences. Dr. Michelle, please share more about Pause for Elders. Well, thanks, Tom, for the introduction. So, Pause for Elders is a big passion of mine. Uh, the relationship between seniors and pets has always been a big, important aspect of being a veterinarian for me. And so I came to develop Pause for Elders after hearing conversations with seniors where there was just gaps in care. So some organizations would offer pet food, sometimes certain organizations would do pet walking, but there didn't seem to be an all-in-one organization that covered it all. Um, and so that's how you know, this came to be. On the Pause for Elders website, you talk about the benefits derived through the human-animal bond. Can you give some examples? There's actually been many benefits, um, mental, health, and physical. Um, some of the benefits that they've shown in studies is that definitely just interactions with pets, even just petting pets or just being around them can reduce stress, it can raise levels of oxytocin. Having a pet in your life as far as um, owning a pet, they know that they, seniors tend to have more of a routine, they exercise more, they tend to get out in the community, they have more positive interactions, they talk about their pets a lot, it gives them a lot of joy. Um, it actually significantly reduces loneliness as well. Are there physical health benefits as well? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the big things that they look at is cardiovascular benefits. So they know it lowers blood pressure. It actually has been shown that they actually have lower blood sugar as well. They tend to have um, better um, heart function dynamics in general. You're also involved with shelter medicine. Uh, that is truly a, a noble calling. How did you become interested in working with shelter animals? Yeah, so it's definitely a, an interesting and, and a little bit of a challenging field um, because you're dealing with animals that sometimes you don't know what their situation was and why they're coming into the shelter, but your goal is to try to get them out. Um, and I think uh, that portrays a lot of different types of challenges than general practice, and I'm lucky to have been in general practice as well as on the shelter side and kind of walked myself all the way through from uh, the animal coming in to the animal leaving and to the animal finally ending up in an adoption. Um, so it's been very rewarding kind of being in that field um, and seeing the animals come in very scared and be able to come into a home and just blossom. There, there's a physical health side of uh, for shelter animals, but is there also a mental health side for the animals that are in the shelter? As, as far as the stress that they undergo? Absolutely. And so, you know, I think things have changed a little bit as far as shelter medicine. Shelter medicine is always growing and trying to change and trying to adapt. And our goal really is trying to get animals out as soon as possible. We know that the shelter environment is stressful. They're in a cage. You know, they want to be loved. They want to be, you know, uh, with a human. Um, and there's a lot of noise. There's a lot of stress. They're scared. Um, so trying to get them out as soon as possible is usually our goal. According to the ASPCA, the number of animals entering shelters and the rate of euthanasia are, are well down over the last decade. Uh, can you talk about the veterinary process the animal goes through when it arrives at a shelter and is evaluated and prepared? For adoption? Sure, absolutely. So animals come in from a variety of um, different locations. So sometimes their owner surrenders. A lot of times they may be coming from other shelters. Sometimes they're coming from other countries, so around the world. And so they're going to come in and have a health check. And basically what we're looking for is there any external signs of illness? How is the animal behaving? Um, is the animal showing any signs of aggression or anything that we have to be concerned about or that we just have to manage a little bit differently? Does the animal have any signs of illness as far as skin infections, um, parasites, um, vomiting or diarrhea, infectious disease? 
Uh, it's very different managing in a shelter versus private practice, and their resources are limited. Um, you know, in a private practice, maybe you can do a ton of blood work, you can do x-rays and other diagnostics, but in a shelter, you have to kind of manage things a little bit differently and kind of use your resources as effectively as possible. Now, when you suspect an animal is struggling with its health, uh, do you withhold that animal for, for adoption or is it still available for adoption and you're simply disclosing that it has some health issues? Yeah, that's a really good question. So it really depends. Um, def definitely if it's something infectious, generally we're going to hold it back. Um, certain things can be infectious to people as well, what we call zoonotic diseases, and so that's always a big concern. Um, certain diseases are very infectious to other animals, so we're trying to protect other animals in the shelter. But certain you know, types of disease um, are not infectious, and the animal can be adopted out, like diabetes. Um, dogs can get diabetes just like people, um, and uh, you know, it's not a contagious disease, but it's something that's manageable. You mentioned that a certain number of animals are surrendered by their owners uh, and enter the, the shelter through that means. If the animals are generally healthy, uh, non-infectious, uh, can you share some insight as to why as many as 10% of adopted animals are surrendered back to the shelter? Yeah, so I think we're talking about two different populations. So animals that were adopted out um, and being returned to the same shelter and then animals that are just being surrendered. And so when we're talking about animals that were adopted out, sometimes you know, it just wasn't a good fit. Uh, they weren't prepared. Sometimes animals act a little differently in the home environment. You know, maybe when they came to interview, the pet was very subdued and quiet, but when it may be in the home environment, it's very rambunctious. Um, sometimes dogs have signs of separation anxiety. For cats, you know, sometimes it's inappropriate urination or defecation around the house, and a lot of times it's stress-related and the change. Um, so behavior is probably one of the biggest things. Sometimes health conditions do come up. Um, there is generally about a two-week um, period where sometimes infectious disease can still come up or, as I said, with the resources are limited um, in shelter, so we can't do every test under the, under the planet. And so, you know, sometimes animals turn out that there's something is going on underneath, like um, maybe a dog has a bladder stone and we didn't know because it was in a cage in, in the shelter. You don't see maybe those signs that you would see in a home environment. So those are kind of the more common reasons that we see. Occasionally there'll be other things where there'll be conflicts with other animals or other people or if somebody has an allergy or there's housing situations as well. How about from the human side? Um, as a, as a uh, owner of, of multiple rescue animals, I know that uh, a rescue animal is going to be a lot of work, particularly in the, uh, in the short term as you mentioned. What do shelters or can shelters do to sort of evaluate the human to make sure that they're going to be appropriate host for this new, uh, this new pet. Yeah, and it definitely depends on the shelter and how much resources they have. Um, private shelters tend to have a little bit more time and resources um, than some of the county um, shelters. And so they generally will try to do an adopter application and kind of evaluate the pet and evaluate the lifestyle of the, the owner and say, hey, are you super active? You know, this, this pet needs a lot of exercise. Are you going to be home a lot? This pet really needs to have somebody that's going to be home and, and to bond a little bit more, um, you know, versus others where they may be okay with that as much attention. Um, and some may not be great with kids and trying to evaluate that. Sometimes we can't evaluate that, you know, uh, so well on the front end. Sometimes we don't figure that out until the back end. How does shelter medicine differ from the more traditional veterinary medicine practiced in clinics for pets of private owners? Um, that's a great question and I think it's something that a lot of um, people are not aware of that there is a big difference and so dealing with shelter medicine uh, you're dealing with a lot more of herd medicine and what that means is that you're doing population health so you're trying to manage a whole population rather than focusing on an individual animal and so you have limited resources and you're trying to um, have the overall health of the population be of paramount versus just one singular animal. And so in a private practice, you know, you might be able to do, have a lot of resources at your fingertips, x-rays, blood work up to the wazoo, but in a shelter, you have to really use your resources mindfully. And so your goal is to try to minimize infectious disease, try to keep the animals as healthy as possible, and try to move them out as quickly as possible. And so as soon as animals come in, you're trying to evaluate them for any obvious signs of a disease, trying to vaccinate them quickly. Um, some of the vaccines actually work pretty effectively and pretty quickly to prevent disease, but not all. Um, you're trying to deworm them, trying to take care of any parasites or anything along those lines, um, and again, just trying to get them out as soon as possible without doing an array of diagnostics. I hear a lot about spay and neutering 
in the shelter uh, environment, and you actually teach this as, uh, as an assistant professor. How do you think of spay and neutering uh, for animals that either come through the shelter environment or people that have animals as companion animals at home? It's a great question. I think spaying and neutering is still very important and there's a lot of uh, benefits, health benefits to spaying and neutering. We know generally that the pets live longer. Um, it is a, an extremely important way for, to us, for us to control the population, especially when we're dealing with shelter animals um, where there still is euthanasia. I think that's one of the most difficult aspects of our um, profession that we still have to deal with euthanasia and the fact that we have to euthanize healthy animals is incomprehensible to be honest and so um, you know population control is one of the biggest ways to do that and the fact that there has been such um, an increase in spaying and neutering um, has significantly brought down the population um, in the private sector, um, you know, I think it's a little bit different. Um, sometimes we can wait till pets are a little bit older. I think generally it's still recommended, um, usually by a year, most breeds. Um, and that can be, you know, something to decide between a veterinarian and a client. But I think in the shelter space, I think it's really important to do spaying and neutering before adoption. As your organization's name suggests, Paws for Elders specializes in seniors. Do seniors face special challenges in adopting rescue animals? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there are you know, some special unique challenges that we think about when we're adopting out to seniors. One is you know, just general mobility and, and what are they capable of? You know, maybe a large breed, a very active dog is not ideal for a senior. We also have to just take some general other things into account. Um, puppies and kittens are very fun, but they can be very rambunctious. Um, they can be destructive, and sometimes our seniors are on certain medications or have conditions where maybe they have thin skin or they're on blood thinners, and you know, kittens and puppies are more likely to scratch and bite, and that's definitely a consideration that we think about. We also kind of have to evaluate the situation in the home environment. Um, is, you know, is this going to be a tripping hazard? Is it going to be a physical problem? Um, how is the you know, senior um, able to get around? Can they get vet care if they need it? Do they have the resources to get vet care? Um, animals, even that animals that appear healthy can sometimes develop medical conditions. Um, are they prepared for that kind of expense? And, and what do they do if they're not? Thank you, that's great. Great question, answers. I mean, what I love about this, um, other than just hanging yeah, out with yeah. you, what I love about this is that you're, you're outing things that aren't really talked about very much. You know, uh, pet ownership rates plummet after age 75 for the reasons you just talked about. Mm -hmm. You know, people worry about their ability to care for them, transporting to the vet, paying for um, those things. Another issue is sort of the mental health side of, uh, you know, people have lost pets before and do they really want to grieve for the loss of another pet and um, I, I love the fact that your organization is so broad in its purview that it can really deal with people that that can benefit from animal companionship regardless of the kind of animal companionship they're they're capable of or, or choose to have right right and I've had some clients that that told me that they just they pray that their pet dies before them I'm like, oh gosh, because they just, they can't imagine on the flip side of them dying and like what's going to happen to their pet. I've had a client also ask that her pets be euthanized when she passes away. Obviously, we're not going to do that. But the, the mindset is they're just so attached and so concerned. It's like, you know, but you're also right. Um, I have seniors that they just can't deal. Um, after they put a pet to sleep, they just cannot fathom that. And that's what happened with one of my favorite clients of all time. She had found a stray Yorkie. Charlie, and she was from Ireland originally, I actually stayed in her house. Um, absolutely adored her, she lived in Queens by herself, and uh, she found Charlie, and he was just the light of her life, but developed a medical condition, and we managed it for as long as we could medically, and then it was either surgery or we just, when it's time, it's time, and she didn't want to go the route of surgery. And then he passed in his sleep kind of unexpectedly, and she was devastated. And so, you know, what do you do in that situation? And so, um, she immediately actually went to the shelter with her daughter and she adopted a puppy. And I didn't talk to her, but if I had, I probably would have had a kind of a prep conversation because that probably wouldn't have been my recommendation is to um, get a puppy. And she struggled. She had a tough time because the puppy was super sweet, but crazy and destructive and just like not like her Charlie, you know, who would just sit at the, you know, breakfast table with her waiting for his um, buttered toast dipped in tea, which 
I talked to her about all the time, but she insisted that she was what we liked. Um, so it was a very different experience, but that's what we're there for, to kind of help guide people. Because I think she went the other end where she's like, well, I want to get something really young, not thinking about the consequences. And then unfortunately she passed away within a year. Um, but she had already had that conversation and we had talked about, um, and her daughter had agreed to take over the care of Max, but we had had that plan. And so I think she felt okay taking on a younger dog, but it was definitely more than she had expected. In addition to facilitating adoption, uh, does Paws for Elders provide other services for seniors who cannot safely or practically care for a live animal? Yeah, that was a good question. So we kind of address seniors, I think, at all levels. So we have our seniors that already own pets trying to provide services so they can keep their pets and then having a plan for that pet. Um, we encourage pet adoption and fostering like we talked about. Um, for seniors that maybe don't want to take on a pet full time, we do pet therapy visits. And then for you know seniors that maybe can't interact with a live animal or maybe want something more consistent without the responsibility of a live animal, we encourage artificial companion animals. You've been an early supporter of Tombot and, and Jenny. Can you talk a little bit more about how you feel that Tombot and Jenny fit into your suite of services for seniors? Yeah, absolutely. So. I have personal experience with um, my Oma, who's my grandma, um, that started to lose her memory. And I had uh, brought a dog out to her that was found as a stray little sushi um, that she just absolutely adored, but uh, unfortunately she started having the memory loss issues and we were faced with what do we do. Um, she absolutely you know, loved sushi, it was a big part of her life. And in that situation we were able to have a family move in with her and take over care of sushi. But that's not a reality for many people. Um, having that bond, having that closeness, um, I think with an animal it does bring a lot of comfort. Um, and in many situations, it's just not safe or practical, or you know, people can't take on the expense. Um, you know, animals, especially as they get a little bit older, there is a big expense associated with it, and a lot of our seniors are on a limited income. And so, um, you know, something like Jenny um, can really fill that gap for many of those seniors. How do you see pause for elders five years from now? Yeah, I love that. That's a great question. So um, when I found a pause for elders, my intent was to make it a model that is easily replicated. Um, even though I'm a veterinarian, it's not my goal to be a veterinary provider. Um, I want that to be kind of a, a back-end thing and so that anybody can do what I'm doing. I, I would love to see Pause for Elders as part of every senior service organization. Um, we're currently providing talks to different gerontology groups um, and schools, so they kind of just kind of start learning that this is really an important aspect of, um, of senior care and senior life, especially as more and more seniors choose to age in place and age at home and loneliness as we know is such a big factor for that I feel like animals are going to be you know a bigger and bigger component for that and so I feel like we will continue to grow and hopefully expand nationally as well as internationally well we're uh, we're pulling for you we think it's a great <laughs> cause and we love uh, we love being friends with you yeah. uh, so thank you dr. Michelle my guest today has been Brianna Michelle doctor of veterinary medicine and president and founder of pause for elders on behalf of the entire Tombot team, thank you for watching. For more information and to learn how you can help us bring Jenny to those people desperately in need, please visit our website at www.tombot.com. I'm Tom Stevens. Be well.